in fact, uh, this is my second trip since um, the war began. And uh, I try to go whenever it's it's possible, also because um, to express solidarity with uh, with people there who are severely impacted by this uh, brutal war, and also to see our colleagues who continue to work um, to serve the the communities through their humanitarian uh, mission that they are doing uh, in in the Gaza Strip. This time, however, it was not just to the south. Uh, I visited. Uh, the middle areas, including the Balah, and then uh, in the south, I went to Rafah and I went to Khan Yunus. Absolutely desperate, uh, Connor. And wherever you looked, um, there were people who are displaced. There were people asking for for assistance, um, and people were just very, very exhausted and tired. Understandably, after three and a half months of what has been a very brutal war. So you visited different areas. Were the conditions very different in those areas or is it desperate everywhere? Look, desperate everywhere. Um, there's no question about that. And I think what was different um, to the first visit I, I took is uh, how congested a city like Rafa has become. Uh, wherever you drove, wherever you walked, wherever you looked, the city was covered with um, these little structures that people who fled to the area have set up. And they're very basic, and there are a couple of wooden poles covered with plastic sheeting. That's all people can find. And this has become home to many, many people. In fact, the population of Rafah in the south has quadrupled since uh, the war began. People kept fleeing, kept looking for uh, shelter in that part of Gaza in the hope that they will find safety and protection. Now, the concern is, and this is what people told me on the ground, is if the military operation expands further south and comes specific to um, to Rafah, like we've seen in Khan Yunus, like we're seeing today, specifically in Khan Yunus, this is a very, very big fear for people in that area. So you spoke to uh, civilians, to aid workers. Do they have a message for people in the outside world? There was um, this one mother that I visited in one of those um, informal structures um, where I went into that structure and there were 26 people living in, I think, less than um, uh, three, three square meters, people on top of each other. She carried her two kids. Um, she told me that they have no way to stay warm at night that um, they were frustrated, that they are tired of this life that they've been forced to live, um, that she was worried about her older mother, about her children. Um, she said all we got um, in terms of, of assistance was one piece of vegetable for the 26 of us. Um, she wanted to wash. She cannot wash because in the area where she is, uh, either the queues are way too long for uh, to go and wash or um, the the showers don't work or they, they don't exist. These are not conditions meant for human beings. Now, when you were there, Juliet, uh, I know that internet and phone access had been cut, which obviously made it very difficult for you to communicate. But what effect is that having on the people in Gaza? This is reoccurring. Since uh, the war began, there's been seven or eight of these telecommunications uh, cuts. And when we say cuts, they're not um, temporary. They're, there's like a total blackout uh, on huge areas. Now, in the south, last time I was there, it was also not great, the communication. But this time there were um, hours on top of hours where we couldn't do anything. You cannot send a simple WhatsApp message. You can forget about placing a phone call from one mobile to another. The phone lines are absolutely cut. Then the Internet is very intermediate. And for the vast majority of, um, of people, they feel extremely cut out from each other and from the rest of the world. And it's also it also plays a role in um, lack of safety, because imagine if uh, you needed to call for an ambulance, you're in the middle of a war zone. Anyway, you need to call for an ambulance. You want to call for help. You want to check uh, on your loved ones. You simply cannot do it. And that's been the longest telecommunications blackout that Gaza has had since uh, the war began. And it is due, my understanding is due to severe damage that was done to 
the telecoms network in the southern part of uh, the Gaza Strip. The other impact that this has is on our own, own aid operation, whether it's UNRWA or the UN in general or the humanitarian organizations in general, because it is, as, as one can imagine, um, very, very challenging to coordinate uh, what is already a logistically cumbersome operation, right? So to call truck drivers, uh, to uh, organize with um, those who do the loading, the offloading, the storing, then the distribution, you need a phone. And that's absolutely um, inevitable. However, in Gaza, that also is, is being challenged. Now you're back at your headquarters in Amman. What are you calling for as an agency right now? Um, since early on, UNRWA has called for a humanitarian ceasefire, so we continue to call for a humanitarian ceasefire, much, much needed, uh, because people need respite, people are exhausted, and a ceasefire will bring respite and calm, not only to people in Gaza, but to people um, everywhere around as well, and across the region by and large. So much, much needed to have this humanitarian ceasefire. Um, meanwhile, there is a need for much more humanitarian supplies, including medicines, including medicines for chronic diseases, which are um, in, in very short supply at the moment. And this is why we said after the trip uh, to Gaza that siege is the silent killer of people in Gaza. What we meant with that is that people are likely dying as a result of hunger or disease or lack of, of medical and, and health care. And then what also needs to happen is more commercial supplies that should come to the private sector in the Gaza Strip because the entire population almost entirely now is relying on humanitarian assistance. And that's not sustainable, not in the medium term and not in the long term.